let's get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeff Brown, and I work on the Grails development team at uh, Pivotal. And what I'm going to be talking about this afternoon is, uh, is metaprogramming with Groovy. Uh, this is really a two-part um, two presentation during this first, uh, first hour or 50 minutes. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, runtime metaprogramming with Groovy, and in the session immediately following uh, this one, in, in this room, of course, uh, I'll be talking about compile time metaprogramming. And uh, we'll see the differences between the two, and uh, uh, what kinds of things are well suited for one, and what kinds of things are well suited for the other, and, and a little bit of compare and contrast, but, but mostly look at them as two separate approaches for doing that programming in, uh, in Groovy. Turns out that Groovy is really, really well suited uh, for doing uh, both kinds of that programming, and uh, we'll see what a lot of that looks like as uh, we press the this. So uh, one thing I'd like to start with is to kind of settle on, on what, I'm, what I'm talking about when I say metaprogramming. So metaprogramming is, is one of these terms that, that can mean different things in different contexts to different folks. Uh, so I want to clarify what kind of metaprogramming we're going to be talking about. Um, so the kind of metaprogramming that uh, we're going to be talking about in uh, this session, the runtime metaprogramming uh, uh, session, is we're going to be writing code, or basically we're going to be writing a program that changes itself while it's running, right? Uh, and it turns out that dynamic languages often are, uh, are really good at that. And in particular, Groovy is, is really good at that. Groovy makes it really easy to do things like um, add methods to classes at runtime while your program is executing. Um, you can replace existing methods while, uh, while your program is, is, is executing. You can intercept calls to methods um, at runtime. You can intercept calls to methods that don't even exist at runtime. Um, and we'll see why, how, not only how you do those kinds of things, but also talk about why you want to be able to do that. Why would you want to call a method that doesn't exist? Well, it turns out there are good reasons to want to call methods that don't exist, as long as there's something in the system that can intercept that call and do something meaningful with that, with that method call. So we'll, we'll look at all those details uh, and see what all that looks like. But uh, so we're talking about, the, the metaprogramming we're talking about is a program, uh, basically a program modifying itself while it's executing. You, that that enables you to do lots of really, really cool things. Uh, Groovy lends itself really well to, to doing those sorts of things, and there, there are a lot of pieces of this puzzle with the Groovy runtime that uh, there are a lot of pieces that to the puzzle that, that enable all of those, a lot of those capabilities. But a lot of them boil down to really one thing, and uh, it's not a small thing, it's a pretty big thing inside of Groovy, but um, all method dispatch and all so uh, everything that I'm about to say applies to method calls the same way it applies to property access. Uh, retrieving the values of properties and assigning values to properties. What we're about to talk about relates to those things in the same way that method invocations work. So I'm just going to say method invocation from now on. But I'm talking about really any interactions with an object. Invoking a method, retrieving a property, assigning value to a property. All of those things um, go through a uh, part of the Groovy runtime that's, uh, that, uh, that is known as the MOP, or Meta Object Protocol. So Groovy has this, uh, the MOP is this really rich and dynamic and flexible dispatch mechanism that every method call goes through. So when you, when you uh, make, make a method call from Groovy, and it's important to, to understand that it, this is true of every single method call that's made from Groovy. Uh, it's not the case that this only applies when you're making calls into Groovy code. That's not the case. If, if, you create, if you write Groovy code that creates a class that was written in Java, so you write something like def sv equals new string buffer, right? The string buffer class, of course, was written in Java as part of the standard JDK. So you create Groovy code that creates a string buffer, and then you call sv.append and pass a string, right? That's just normal stuff that Java developers are used to doing, right? There's an append method on the string buffer class. From Groovy's perspective, right, when you call append, that, that call to append goes through Groovy's dynamic dispatch mechanism, even though you're talking to a Java object. It doesn't matter. What, what's significant is that the call is coming from Groovy. So every single method call that, that is uh, made from Groovy goes through this dynamic dispatch mechanism that we're going to drill into and talk about a lot of details of. Uh, so uh, a good way to, to just kind of start exploring some of uh, some of what I'm getting at there, what I'm talking about there, is to look at a class that's provided by Groovy called the Expando class. So there's a class in Groovy called Expando, and uh, lines of code on this slide kind of demonstrate how the Expando, some of the things you can do with with, uh, with an instance of the Expando class. 
so you create an instance of the Expando class just like you create an instance of any other class. Um, so here we're, we're invoking a uh, no argument constructor. The second line of code uh, is assigning a value to a property. So in this case, the property name is favorite language. And uh, I promise that we looked at the source code for the Expando class, and there is no property in that class called favorite language. But somehow that line of code works. And I can say my expando that favorite language equals Ruby. My expando that hometown equals St. Louis. Uh, my town, uh, my expando that anything equals anything will work. You can just make up property names and assign them values. I want to be clear that that is not how all objects behave in Groovy. There's specifically there's code in the expando class to allow you to do that. We're going to drill into that and see what that looks like. But it's not the case that, in general, you can just create an instance of some class, make up properties, and assign them values. For most classes, that won't work. For most classes, what you'll end up with is a missing property exception. When you try to assign a value to a property that doesn't exist. But there's special code in the Expando class that allows that to work. More on the details there in just a minute. If the value you assign to one of these made up properties is a closure, uh, which is the case in this third line of code. Right? We've got my expando that add numbers equals closure. Uh, the closure is a block of code. Uh, this particular closure accepts two parameters. Right? The first one is called i, the second one is called j. And the closure returns the sum of those two things. Right? So if you invoke this closure and pass two numbers, what you're going to get back is the sum of those two numbers. And if you invoke that, that same closure and pass two strings, what you're going to get back is the concatenation of those strings. So if the value that you assign to one of these made-up properties is a closure, like my standard I add numbers was closure, then effectively what you've done is you've added a method to this particular instance of the expando class. Not all expandos, but this particular instance. You've added a method to that, to that object whose name matches this property name, so add numbers. And the implementation of the method is whatever's inside the closure. Right? So in this case, uh, uh, the closure just adds the two parameters and returns the, uh, returns the result of that issue. So you can create an expand object, make up properties, and assign values. If the value you assign to one of those properties is closure, then what you've done is you've added a method to that particular expand object. In the last couple of lines there, we can interact with those things. Uh, we can verify that uh, when I retrieve the value of the favorite language property, that it is what I expect it to be. You know, when I invoke the add numbers method that doesn't exist, somehow that works. Uh, I pass it 60 and 40 and get that 100. And finally, the last line of code there is expressing how the expando behaves when you retrieve the value of something that doesn't exist. And it doesn't throw an exception or uh, it, it just evaluates to null. Right? So if I said my expando.foo, if I retrieve the value of my expando.foo and I haven't assigned it a value, it'll be null. Right? So let's uh, figure out how all that works. And understanding how that works will enable you to, uh, once you understand how that works, you'll identify ways in your own application development to take advantage of some of these same techniques to do interesting things. So anytime you assign a value to a property in Groovy, like expand over that favorite language equals Groovy, uh, a number of things might happen. One thing that might happen is if there really is a favorite language property in the expando class, that property will be assigned a value. If there is no favorite language property in the expando class, there are a number of other things that might happen. One thing that might happen is the Groovy runtime might look to see if there's a method in the expando class called set property. And if there is, that's the method that Groovy, Groovy will call that method on your app. So you would never write expando.set property favorite language Groovy. You would write expando.favorite language equals Groovy. And what the Groovy runtime could do with that is it can invoke the set property method in the expando class if that method exists. The same with retrieving the value of a property. When you retrieve the value of a property, one of the things that might happen at runtime is Groovy can look in the expando class in this case and see is there a method called get property. And if there is, Groovy can call that and pass it in the name of the property that it wants the value of and get back whatever uh, the get property method decides to return. <coughs> So th this is our first look at uh, some of the behavior, some of the stuff that's going on inside of that dynamic dispatch mechanism, the MOP that, that I mentioned earlier. When you do property access in either direction, assigning properties or retrieving the values of properties, Groovy uh, will look for special methods like set property and get property to, to help do those assignments and retrieve values. It will look at, we'll drill down even another layer 
a deeper than this in a minute and get, get a better sense for how that works momentarily. Uh, anytime you invoke a method, uh, so expando.add numbers 66. If there really is such such a method, that method uh, might get executed. Another thing that might happen is uh, so, so the slide here uh, represents a call to expando.invoke method. And that would work, but we're going to take advantage. Uh, I'm going to write some code in a minute, and uh, we're going to take advantage of some capabilities that invoke method doesn't offer. So replace invoke method with method missing, and the rest of this will be, uh, for the sake of this conversation, it would be the same. Uh, so if you call, well, if you invoke a method that doesn't exist, like add numbers, one of the things that the Groovy runtime can do is look to see if there's a method missing method in the expando class, and if there is the runtime might call that method. So let's uh, let's explore some of that in real code and see, uh, see if we can clear up what a lot of that means. So we're going to create a whole, we're going to pretend that the expando class does not exist. And we're going to write a whole new one. So we're going to write a class called great expando. And I'm also going to write a test so we can interact with that thing and describe how it's supposed to be. Call the test, create expando spec. I'm going to write a Spock specification. How many of you are familiar with Spock? That's fantastic. Uh, Spock is just a, a, an amazing, uh, spectacular testing framework. All right, create expando spec void test property access. We're going to write a method to describe how our newly created uh, expand over. So I want to see if I do that. And uh, the XP, that favorite language you can screw me. I want to assert that the value that I get back is what I expect it to be. Right? That looks right. I create an instance of the expando class. Right? I create an instance of the great expando class, assign a value to a property that doesn't exist, and then retrieve the value and uh, make it an assertion about what I expect to happen. So I just ran that test, and the test failed. You see the red bar up there. Uh, the font down here is tiny. You probably can't read that. But what it says is a missing property exception. This right here threw an exception because I tried to assign a value to a property that doesn't exist. Remember I said earlier that the behavior that I described when I described how the expando class works, that's not how objects in general behave in Ruby. There's code specifically in the expando class to, uh, to support that. Remember what happens when you assign a value to a property is Groovy, the Groovy runtime will look to see if there's a set property method in the class, and if so, that method will be called. So what we want to do is put a set property method in our new uh, expando class. I'm just going to leave it empty for now. Uh, this exception occurred at line 12, which is this line right here. Right? Let's run our test again. We're going to get the same exception, but uh, it's going to come from a different place this time. There you go. That says line 15. This line threw the missing property exception now. So this worked. It didn't do anything interesting. It really didn't. It didn't, didn't do anything interesting, but it did not throw an exception. This is throwing the exception now. Um, so I'm trying to retrieve the value of the property that doesn't exist. So let's put a get property method here. And we'll also leave that one empty for now. Now when I run my test, the test is still going to fail, but it's going to fail in a different way. Uh, so no exception was thrown, uh, but this expectation was not met. EXP, that favorite language, evaluated to null, and I expected it to evaluate to Ruby. Now with just uh, maybe two lines of code, we can get this working. Add those lines of code, and uh, then we'll back up and talk about what's going on. So you got name it props, uh, sub prop name equals val. And then down here, I'll just uh, retrieve the name it props, sub uh, prop name. All right, bear with me just a minute. We'll come back to that. I want to see a green bar here. There we go. Our test passed. So let's take a look at what I just wrote and uh, make sure this all makes sense. Uh, so what I did was uh, just declared a protected property here called dynamic props. There's nothing magic about the name dynamic props. It's just an empty map. I could have called it anything. Right? So anytime set property is called, 
what I'm doing is putting a new entry in the map where the key for that entry is the prop name and the value is uh, whatever value was assigned to uh, prop name. So if I said exp.favoritelanguage equals groovy, this method is called prop name is favorite language and val is groovy. And I'm just putting a new entry in the map where the key is favorite language and the value is groovy. Questions about this right here? Good. All right. And then when get property is called, when I try to retrieve the value of favorite language, get property is invoked, prop name will be favorite language. So this is returning the value in the map that's associated with the key favorite language. No questions about any of that? Simple enough? All right. Let's write uh, one more test here. We're going to add one more feature to this uh, this class. Let's say when the XP All right, so I've added a uh, new property. I've added a property to this uh, this this expando instance called add numbers. Uh, the value that I'm assigning to that property is a closure that accepts three parameters and uh, essentially returns the sum of those three parameters. Say 100. Let's see. XP dot add numbers 60, 30, and 10 is equal to 100. Right. Let's run our test, and the first test should pass, and the second test should fail. And when the second test fails, it should fail with a missing uh, a missing method exception. And it did. This says missing method exception, no signature of method add numbers is applicable. So right here, I'm invoking a method that does not exist. So one way we can make this pass is we can put an add numbers method in the expando class, but that's, that's not what we want to do. We want to intercept that call to a method that doesn't exist using method missing. Like that. And uh, we'll put in about three lines of code here. And again, we'll talk about these lines of code when we get passing and test. See if that thing is a closure. back to that code momentarily. Let's uh, see a green bar again, make sure our tests are passing. And they are, both of those tests, yeah, both of them just ran and passed. So when my test invokes uh, add numbers, uh, we're invoking a method that doesn't exist, right? There's no add numbers method in the great expand of class. Uh, when you invoke a method that doesn't exist, uh, one of the things that the group your runtime is going to do, well, what it does by default is it will throw a missing method exception, which is what happened the last time we were in this. Well, one of the things that the Groovy will do before throwing a missing method exception is Groovy will look to see if there's a method missing method in this class, uh, and there is. So Groovy will invoke that method, where the first argument is the name of the method that was called. So in our case, that's add numbers. And the second argument is uh, an array that includes all of the, the values that were passed as arguments. So I don't have to dynamically type this, but I, or stat statically type this, but I could. Uh, the second argument is an array that includes all of the things that were passed to the method call. Um, using uh, the asterisk operator here, uh, in, in this particular context, the ast what the asterisk operator does is it pulls all the individual elements out of an array or a collection and passes them as discrete arguments into a method call or an enclosure invitation in this case. So this is similar to something like this. Or sub zero. So, that indices right there. Right, it's like that. But if I wrote it like that, now I'm for part coded, so only I can only support three arguments, right? If there are more than three arguments, I'm going to ignore them. And if there are fewer than three arguments, this is going to throw an array index that bounce exception or something like that. The spread operator is uh, more dynamic. It will pull however many elements are in the array, it will pull them all out and pass them as individual arguments into problem in this case, whatever it is that we're invoking. Uh, the numbers have to match there. If they don't, then uh, we might still get an exception. And I'm going to forego writing the exception handling and complicating this any more than I have to, uh, just to focus on the parts of the, the runtime that are, that, that are interesting in terms of metaprogramming. So uh, invoking the closure, well, let me back up. So I'm retrieving the value from the map whose name is add numbers. And checking to make sure that thing really is a closure. If it's not a closure, then I don't want to try to resolve this. But if it is a closure, 
that I will invoke that closure and pass all these arguments into the closure and then return whatever the closure was. So this method missing is how this is, uh, is made to work. Comments or questions about any of that? Yes, sir. Wouldn't you need a death in front of the arts there when you're defining the method missing, or would you assume that? The question is, do I need a death in front of the arts? Are you talking about here? Yeah. Yeah, anytime you're declaring arguments to a method or a closure in Groovy, if, uh, if you want the type to be uh, object, you can put def there or not. You can leave it out. Uh, notice I did the same thing over here, right? So I can put the def here, but uh, I don't. Uh, you can't uh, consider it a style issue, but I don't think that's very good. It'll work. It does exactly the same thing. If you leave the type off, the def is applied. Does that make sense? Yes, if you pass uh, four numbers instead of three, yeah, so the closure. Uh, what was the last part? Will it find the closure since it expects uh, three properties? Yeah, the question is if I pass the wrong number of arguments, like this, yeah. right? If I, if I pass the wrong number of arguments, what will happen? And what's going to happen is we're going to get a, uh, an exception trying to invoke the closure with the wrong number of arguments. We'll run this test and we'll see that. Right, missing method exception, no signature of method, call on the closure. But a little bit cryptic, but what it's telling me is that uh, the reason I got the exception is the number of arguments here does not match the number of arguments here. And we could add some complexity here. I don't think the real expander does this, but we could add some complexity here and say if uh, args.length is, uh, is not equal to uh, is it, maximum number of arguments, like that. We can check and make sure that the two match, and if they don't, you know, as the author of this class, we get to decide what to do. Um, but that, that's just some, some error handling and, and other uh, complication that I don't want to drill down the But that's what happens. If you invoke a closure and you don't pass the correct number of arguments, you're going to get an exception. Uh, specifically, you get a missing method exception, and uh, it's because uh, what Ruby's doing when you invoke a closure is it's invoking the method on the closure is called call. And if the Argument lists don't match up, then uh, that, there is no matching call method, which is why you get a method, method missing exception. So, 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 so if you don't define your closure with any arguments, does it assume there's only zero or one? The question is, if you declare a closure and don't declare any arguments, so like that, uh, how many arguments does the closure accept? And if you don't declare any arguments mm -hmm. and you do it like this, the closure can be invoked with zero arguments or one. If you declare it like this, that's explicitly saying zero arguments. So now you have to pass exactly zero arguments. Uh, so here I can pass zero or one. Uh, here I have to pass exactly one. And here I have to pass exactly zero. If you leave uh, the uh, argument list off altogether, the closure accepts one optional parameter. It could be there or not. All right. Let's press on. Any other questions about that before I can press on? Um, yes? Is there a way to refer to the property that you set with the closure that you're passing with? So like a political itself or something? There is. Uh, and the expander class does not behave that way. But uh, really quickly, let's uh, explore that. So if I were to say, I'm going to use the, the real expander here. And uh, it's an ex that uh, age equals 44. X that uh, double the age equals. This is what we're talking about, right? Yeah. Something like that. And uh, if I were to do something like this, like that. Right. So we got 88. Right. That's twice our age. Uh, one issue, one difference between using the expando class and just using a map. So if I said ex.age equals 44, ex.doubleage equals, I do that. I think we're going to see different behavior here. So no behavior at all. Right. So we've got, we've got an exception here, no such property <coughs> reach. And often, when, when folks uh, first look at the expando class, kind of understand, uh, even if, if they don't understand how it works, if you just understand the kinds of things you can do with it, 
This code would work exactly the same if we used a map instead of an expando. Just to replace the first line with def my expando equals new map. The rest of that code would all behave exactly the same. The difference is what you asked about, and that is this won't work with a map, right? It's a, there's a way to make it work, but as written, it won't work. With the expando class, when the a closure that uh, you assign to one of these uh, dynamic properties refers to a property that doesn't exist, one of the things that will happen in, in runtime as Kirby tries to evaluate that expression is it will look at the expando class to see is the property there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's press on. So let's talk uh, a little bit more about closures and uh, closure delegates because they're an important part of how a lot of this stuff works. Uh, so every closure has a, a thing associated with, has a property uh, called delegate associated with. Every closure has exactly one delegate, one delegate. And that delegate gets an opportunity to respond to method calls that are made while the closure is executed. Uh, and it turns out that's useful when you're building DSLs and builders. And let's explore a little bit about uh, how the delegate property works and we'll come back and, and tie that into builders and, and uh, DSLs. So if I said closure equals that, so uh, and I run that, Not, nothing interesting is going to happen. I'm going to run it. There we go. Nothing happened. If I invoke the closure, now something different is going to happen. We should get an exception. Right? And we did get an exception. We got, a, we got a missing method exception. So the closure executed. And when we got to line two, the closure tries to invoke a method named append and pass Jeff as an argument. And there is no append method. Append is not a keyword in Ruby. There's no, there's no magic about the word append. It's just uh, I put anything here. It's just a word. Right? So that's going to uh, result in a missing method exception. If I did this, though, so sp equals new string buffer, c, uh, c delegate equals sp. I'll see what that gets. Right? So the, the value of the string buffer is Jeff is in Minnesota. Let's figure out how that why that is. So this closure was constructed. I uh, notice that when the closure is constructed, the string buffer doesn't even exist. Right? The closure is not making any reference to the string buffer that doesn't even exist. So uh, the closure object is instantiated and, and it's created, it's in memory. And the code inside of the closure is invoking a method named append. Uh, what lines six and seven are doing, really what line seven is doing, is assigning a value to that closure's delegate. Remember, every closure has a delegate associated with it. And the delegate gets an opportunity to respond to method calls that are made while the closure is executed. Now, what that means is when line two executes, and we call append, the string buffer object gets an opportunity to respond to that method call. Uh, so Ruby's going to ask the delegate, hey, if someone were to invoke the append method and pass a string argument to an instance of you, right, the string buffer class, uh, could you respond to that method call? And uh, the mechanism inside of Ruby that's sorting that out will say yes, because there is, in fact, a method in the string buffer class called append that is compatible with the string argument. So instead of throwing the missing method exception, Ruby will invoke that method on the delegate. Okay. Uh, there, there's more pieces of this that we have to tease out. But uh, questions about that so far? Is there a default delegate? Is there, the question is, is, is there a default delegate? And uh, the answer is sort of. So there's another property associated with every closure called the owner. So there's an owner and a delegate. And they each get an opportunity to respond to method calls that are made when the, uh, when the closure is executing. And by default, there, if you don't assign a value to the delegate, it's as if the delegate doesn't exist. The only thing that can respond to method calls when the closure is executing is the owner. So it, with respect to that, you, you might say that the owner is the default delegate. But it's, it's really not. They're two, two different things. The owner is always the thing that created the closure. It's always the thing that created the closure. And it's a read-only property. You can't assign the value. But it's as if you did this. Every time you create a closure, every time you create a closure, the first thing you do is you assign a value to the owner, and the owner is always this, the thing that just created the closure. You never do that. If you don't do that assignment, the owner will be this. So whatever created the closure is the owner. Uh, if you don't assign a value to the delegate, 
property, then the owner is the only thing that can respond to method calls when the closure is executed. If you do assign value to the delegate, the owner and the delegate each uh, might respond to method calls. We're going to tease out how Ruby decides which, which one of those, but we'll look at that in a little bit more detail right now. So let's uh, write a class to do this. Demo. Gets 
first opportunity at responding to that method call. And if the delegate can respond to it, then that's what happens. Uh, the delegate gets the first crack at that responding to that method call. When the resolve strategy is owner first, it's the other way around, right? We check the owner first, and if the owner can respond, that's what happens. And if not, then we check the delegate second. And if the delegate can respond, it does. And if, it does, if the delegate can't respond to the method call, then this is not the So owner first means the owner is checked first. Delegate first means the delegate is checked first. And if either of those fail, then the other one is tried second. The other two options, owner only and delegate only, mean just what the, the name suggests. If the resolve strategy is delegate only, then the owner never gets a chance to respond to anything. Everything has to go to the delegate. If the delegate can't do it, we'll get a this one. Uh, the other way around, right? If, if the resolve strategy is owner only, then the delegate is never involved in anything. Right? Question? Yes. Can you, can, do you have access to the delegate and owner within the closure? Uh, the question is, do you have access to the delegate and the owner inside of the closure? Is that, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, the answer is yes. In fact, there are interesting ways to take advantage of that. So if I were to do, uh, we'll just explore one of the things we're going to discuss later. Uh, so if I said, name me cool to speak. Am I going to turn it off? This is on. There's a red light. Are we getting any audio? No. I'm going to fill this just a moment if this doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm oh, sorry? There's no, another one that you switched. Had to switch these things? There should be another light. Yeah, there. spare. Spare one. Uh, I don't see it. the second tray. <laughs> if we can't resolve this quickly, I'll just speak loudly and move on. So I'll, I'll try to speak loudly, and hopefully, hopefully you hear me. Uh, so if I interrogate this object and ask it what it is, uh, we'll see that it's an instance of java.lane.string. It's not any special string class provided by Groovy or just a java.lane.string object. So if I were to try to do something like this, right, that's not going to work. There is no pig Latin property on, uh, in the java.lane.string class. Is something like that. String dot meta class. Get pick Latin. Get closure. Mm. All right. Let's see what that does. Uh, so that evaluates to eight jig. Right. We've got the pig Latin version of the string jig uh, on line seven. So the way this works is. From Groovy's perspective, every class has a meta class associated with it. Every class has a meta class associated with it. Not just Groovy classes, every class. So here we're referring to the meta class that's associated with java.ling.string. And there are a number of things you can do with that meta class. And one of the things you can do with it is you can interact with it the same way you interact with an expander. And that is you can just make up a property and assign that property a value that is a closure. And what you've done is you've added a method called get pig Latin to the string class. And that means every string now has, uh, has that method, including strings that existed before you did that. Right? So if we did this, this will still work. Right? I created a string. The string's out there on the heap. It's, it, it exists. It's, initialized, it's out there on the heap. And then after that occurred, I modified the string class and said, from this point forward, all strings have a method called get pig Latin. And uh, so now I can invoke get pig Latin. I'm using the property access here and just as well be explicit and do this. Right? That'll work just as well. Uh, so uh, any class dot meta class dot name enclosure adds a method to that class. But if you uh, ran the, if you did that on an instance? Yes, yeah, so the question is can you do that on an instance? And the answer is yes. So instead of string dot meta class dot get pig Latin, I can do something like this. I can say name dot meta class dot get pig Latin, and now I'm modifying that particular instance's meta class. Um, in the, so I don't want to go too far down that path, other than to warn you against uh, doing really crazy stuff 
it's, it, it can be challenging enough if you're, uh, when you're doing runtime meta programming, sometimes it can be challenging to, to figure out where are these methods coming from and why, where is this behavior coming from. And if you start modifying instances meta classes, that gets even crazier, right? They've got two different instances of the exact same class. They seem to be instances of the exact same class, and they behave differently. Uh, so that doesn't mean you should never do that, but uh, make sure you understand what's going on and don't, you know, use your powers for good and not for evil. Don't create crazy stuff that no one will ever comprehend later. Yeah. Can you assign a delegate to your delegate? No, because the question is, can you assign a delegate to your delegate? There's, Remember, we can't manage for now. Um, just, a, just a second. Uh, next button, we'll the CD. I can't understand. Is he saying something that he doesn't realize the mic is on? Yeah. He's putting the battery in there. All right. Uh, so the question was, uh, can you assign a delegate to a delegate? Remember, what delegate is, is it's a property of a closure. It's a property of a closure. So if your delegate is a string buffer, you string buffers don't have delegates, right? So it doesn't make sense. The only thing that, well, as far as what we're talking about, the only thing that has a delegate property associated with it is a closure. So you can't assign a delegate a delegate unless the delegate was a closure for some reason. Uh, so inside of the closure here, I'm referring to delegate, right? Uh, and the delegate, when you do something like this, when you say strict that meta class, that get trigger that equals closure, the delegate will always be the object that the method was invoked on. So in this case, it's going to be whatever object this reference points to. So in this case, it's the string Jake. So inside of this closure, uh, the value of delegate is the string Jake. Right? And if uh, this were a different string, then of course it would have a different value. But the delegate inside the closure, the delegate is the thing that the method was invoked on. Right? It's like this. If this code were inside the string class, uh, it's not, obviously, right? The string class is part of the JDK. But if inside the string class you have a method called get big Latin, inside of that method you would refer to this, right? That means this, this string. Uh, when you're using this, this approach for adding methods to classes at runtime, the way to do that is to refer to the delegate. Before Groovy invokes this closure, it will have set the delegate to be the thing that the method was invoked. Questions about any of that? All right. So, a couple other things I want to uh, want to talk about. Uh, we've explored all of this. Uh, for those of you who have done uh, Rails development, uh, this code uh, will, will look familiar, right? This looks like a domain class called User. The domain class declares uh, some properties, and uh, there's a static property in this domain class called Constraints, and the value that's assigned to that Constraints property is a closure. And inside the closure, we're invoking methods that don't exist. We're invoking methods that don't exist. There is no login method, there's no password method, there's no email method, and there's no age method. But somehow, that, uh, the code inside that closure is made meaningful. So what happens when you do something like invoke login, and pass login colon 5315, blank colon false, and mean colon true? is that you're expressing some rules about, uh, about the login property. What we're saying is the, uh, the property has to be at least five characters long. It cannot be any more than 15 characters. It has to be unique. Right? We can't have two in the database that have the same login. And uh, we don't want a blank login. Um, so you're expressing some rules about what are valid values to this property. Uh, the way this works at, at, at runtime is Rails at uh, application startup time will discover all your domain classes and look in each of them to see if this constraints property exists. And if it does exist, Rails grabs that closure and executes it. But if that's all Rails did, then that would result in missing method exceptions, right? Login, there, there is no method. It's like when I call the pen inside the closure, we have a missing method exception. The same thing would happen here. So before invoking the closure, what Rails has done is it will create an instance of some class whose name we don't care about, just something that's inside of the core of Rails. And that class has a method missing in it. Right? That class has a method missing in it. And that instance, the instance in that class that's created, is set to be the delegate on this closure before it's invoked. So when the closure invokes the login method, that ends up going to the method missing in the delegate, which is this class that's part of Rails core. And what that method missing is doing is looking at the method name. So the method name is login. Then it checks to see, is there a login property in the user class? There is. 
So when this user class is mapped to the database, say using Hibernate, which is a bunch of configuration stuff that Rails is, is doing, it's configuring Hibernate on your behalf to do the mapping. The, some of the arguments that you pass to the login method there, like length 5.15, affect that mapping. So the method missing recognizes that you're trying to configure the login property and that length means something special, and blank means something special, and unique means something special, and a bunch of Hibernate configuration stuff happens in response to this first line of code inside the constraints closure. The, the simple demo stuff that I just wrote this afternoon covers most of the pieces of the puzzle that it takes to make that, to make that happen. Right? We, we, uh, I've seen how method missing works, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about closure delegates. So if you ever looked at this constraints closure and wondered how that, how can that behave, right? I'm calling methods that don't exist, and how does that work? Uh, we've seen most of the pieces of, of that, that puzzle that make sense? Uh, builders use this kind of approach a lot, right? So if I come back here to our uh, to our script and say XHTML XML If, uh, when you do this, 
That affects the string class. That, that means that all strings that are created from that point forward will have the new behavior, and all the strings that already exist will also have that. Is there a way to tell when searching that something's been defined as far as that programming is the actual definition? Do you get any kind of indicator when you're trying to maintain Yeah, the question is can you discover if a method is uh, was dynamically added at runtime? Is that, is that right? Yeah. And uh, the answer is yes. So you can, there, there are a lot of things you can do with a meta class. You can interrogate it and ask it for. Uh, all the dynamic methods, you can ask it for all the properties, and a lot of stuff you can do with the meta class that I haven't demonstrated here. But the answer to your question is yes, you can, you can look at the meta class and discover if there is a meta method there. And then separate from that, you can link Ruby out of it all together and just use job.lang.reflect reflection, and that'll tell you what methods are in the real class. So, so if you do this, we add a get big Latin method to the string class using this technique. And then we go, go use job.lang.reflect stuff to discover all the methods. This one, of course, is not going to be there. Right? So you can interrogate the meta class and discover all the dynamic methods it knows about. That's one thing you can do separate from that or in addition to that. You can use uh, reflection to discover what methods are really in the class. Um, yeah. So you can find out. Uh, you can answer questions like that. Yeah. One more question, then I'll go ahead and break. And I'm, I'm going to be here for the next hour anyway. I'm happy to answer more. But uh, I'll address one question, then we'll take a break. Yeah. So you showed you could get a lot of what you get out of uh, Expando from using a map of, of properties and right. closures. So what would you use in Expando as opposed to just using that? Yes, the question is that uh, Expando and maps have a lot of things in common. You can create a map and just make up properties and assign values. You can do the same thing with the Expando. Uh, so when would you use one versus the other? Uh, and for lots of things, they're interchangeable, right? You could do use one or the other and just call it personal preference. It's not a big deal. There are differences in behavior, right? The kind of implicit this that, that you asked about earlier is if you want this closure that uh, you're assigning values to, to be able to, let's go up here. If you want this closure to be able to refer to other dynamic properties that have been added, uh, as we saw earlier, that behaves differently for expandables than it does for maps. So whichever of those is more consistent with your requirements might help you pick one over the other. But for lots of things that you might use an expandable for, you could just as well use a nap. And there's really no big, it's not a big deal one way or the other for lots of these cases. All right. Uh, so let's take a break. At uh, 4.30, I'm going to pick up with uh, the next bit. All right. Uh, so let's get started. It's uh, 4.30. And uh, so uh, most of you were in the room for uh, the, the session immediately uh, for the previous one. So I talked about uh, runtime metaprogramming with Groovy. Let's see if I can turn this down a little bit. Uh, so, so I spent the last hour or so talking about uh, runtime metaprogramming with Groovy. And uh, during that session we see that uh, you can interact with uh, the Groovy runtime and to do interesting interesting things like intercept calls to methods that don't exist and add new methods to classes. And, uh, I don't think I demonstrated this, but you can use the same technique to replace existing methods. So if you wanted to add your own uh, whatever, your own append method to the string buffer class, you can do that using the same technique you would use to add a new method, you would just use the same name as the existing method. So uh, all of that was happening at, uh, at runtime, right? Uh, we weren't doing any special compile time tricks, all of that's happening at runtime. And what I'm going to talk about uh, for the next, uh, next 15 minutes or so is uh, some of the same kinds of things you can do with Ruby, but at compile time. And a lot of what I'm going to look at, uh, demonstrate here that this afternoon is uh, you might uh, consider it uh, more advanced than stuff that you don't want to necessarily uh, embrace in, in your own application code. But uh, it's important to understand how this stuff works, and uh, you'll find interesting ways to take advantage of it. This isn't the sort of thing that uh, you're not going to build most of your application using uh, compile time metaprogramming stuff. This is uh, uh, once you understand how it works, you'll be able to identify what kinds of problems uh, compile time metaprogramming solves. And, and and maybe uh, find interesting ways to, to take advantage of, of that. Uh, so metaprogramming is, uh, uh, Ruby supports two fundamentally different kinds of metaprogramming, right? There's runtime metaprogramming and compile time metaprogramming. Just in the interest of time, that's what I kind of uh, press on and get into, into the details. Uh, we're going to spend most of this hour, by the way, uh, writing code and playing with a compiler and, and getting a sense for uh, what a lot of the, the, the hardware details here can look like. Uh, so those of you who, who are familiar with doing uh, Rails development, 
uh, whether you uh, realize it or not, in, in recent versions of Rails, you're taking advantage of uh, compile time, uh, compile time metaprogramming all over the place in the framework. So when the Groovy compiler does its thing, right? When the Groovy compiler is compiling the Groovy code, uh, it has to read in your source code, right? So your source code is just a bunch of text in a file, right? So there, there's a part of the compiler that reads that file in. And uh, the file has to be parsed, right? So you've got a text like class person and then curly braces. And inside of that class, you've got string space first name and string space last name. And you define methods and closures and put code inside the methods. Uh, so there's a part of the compiler that parses all of that and creates a representation in memory of, of what you've expressed in your source code. And that representation in memory is known as an AST, uh, which stands for an abstract syntax tree. Right? So the source code is parsed, and this tree is created in memory that represents uh, what you've expressed in your source code. Uh, when you write an AST transformation, an AST transformation is kind of literally what the name suggests. It's a thing that transforms an AST. So the AST is the thing that the Ruby compiler is creating, that uh, is a representation of what you've expressed in your source code, this tree of nodes. And then an AST transformation can modify that, that tree of nodes. Inside of Rails, that happens all over the place, right? So there are a lot of the kind of magic methods that show up. So all, all of your domain classes have a method called save. Right? That's how you persist an instance of that class to the database. Uh, that save method is added to your domain classes at compile time. If you look inside the bytecode, you'll see that there's a real save method there. In older versions of Rails, uh, that save method was added at runtime using some of the metaprogramming techniques I talked about in the, the previous hour. But in recent versions of Rails, that save method is added at compile time. Uh, save is just one example. There are lots and lots of methods that are added to uh, artifacts like the main classes and controllers and tag libs and services. Uh, Rails has done a lot of stuff at compile time to add a lot of the behavior that Rails has to offer to your classes. Uh, so you're taking advantage of ASD transformations, uh, even if you're not writing any and, and uh, aren't even aware that they exist. Uh, in recent versions of Rails, you're using ASD transformations. Yeah. So the compile time transformation says, does that apply more to when you produce a war, or is it also when you're running like in development mode? Yeah, the question is, uh, do compile time transformations apply in development mode, or do they just apply when you're creating a war, or both, or when do they apply? Uh, the compile time transformations are applied at compile time, right? So when you run in development mode, your code is compiled, and the transformations are applied there. And then later, if you happen to build a war with that, those class files, the transformation apply there as well. But the ASD transformations apply in all those contexts, right? In your development mode, when you're running your unit tests, when you're running integration tests, functional tests, when you put a, uh, uh, create a war file, uh, all of those are using the same dot class files that are created that were affected by the ASD transformations. Is there another hand over here? Uh, Ruby provides a bunch of ASD transformations that you can use in your Ruby code. Without writing your own transformations, you can take advantage of existing ones. Now, I'll demonstrate one simple one, and then I want to uh, press on and we'll start writing, writing our own ASD transformations. It's just really cool, crazy stuff. Or we can just look at the QA page. What's going on?
So they can call put, and get, it is empty in size, and entry set, and all that stuff. They're interacting directly with the MyHelper object. It just turns out that an implementation detail inside the MyHelper class is it's delegating all the map work off of this other thing. Right? This is a, a fairly common piece of code that shows up uh, often in right proxies like this. You've got a thing that delegates off to some other thing. Uh, and you can do this in Groovy, right? This is all valid Groovy code and this works. But uh, maybe the reason that you want to do this is uh, you want to delegate all this behavior off to the real map, but one of these methods you want to do something special. Like in the, in the put method, maybe you want to uh, make sure all the keys are uppercase. So when someone calls put and they pass a string and some value, you convert the string to uppercase and that's the key for whatever reason. So, so you have to provide implementations for all these methods, and they're all just delegating off to the other map, except for this one that does some special work before it delegates to the map. Maybe that's the reason you want that, that this whole uh, uh, proxy exists. A better way to, to solve this problem is with Groovy's delegate annotation. And I can get rid of all of these methods now. There we go. Let me get rid of this. And I can just uh, write a class and express that this class has a map property and express that I want to delegate to that map property. There's an ASD transformation that's part of Ruby, right? We're not going to write it, it's, it's provided by the language, that is triggered by this annotation. And what that particular ASD transformation is doing is it's recognizing this static type. You have to use the static type here. It's recognizing that static type. So the compiler knows that. The my helper class delegates to a map. And what, what the compiler will do is it will look at all the methods that are declared in the map interface and generate all of them in this class. Right? So inside the my helper bytecode, there will be a method called contains key and a get and a put and an entry set, all those methods that are declared in the map interface. And they all behave like this. Right? So the compiler adds this method for you. Like that, and all the others, right? They're all just one-liners that delegate to that other thing. And if all you want to do is just <laughs> delegate everything to the other thing, then uh, you don't have to write any methods at all. You just leave the code just like this. We go out here and look at the bytecode that was generated for that. I just ran Java P. Uh, the class implements map, even though I didn't say it implements map, right? Uh, but the, the ASD transformation makes this class implement map because I'm delegating to a map. And there are methods in here like is empty and key set and put. All the math methods are in here. And like I said, they're all basically one liners that, uh, that delegate out to my own map. And then maybe you want to override one of those methods. Uh, let's see what we want to do that. Let's do put. And instead of just doing this, You want to do something special, like uh, if key is a string, key equals key dot two uppercase. Some arbitrary requirement there. Why isn't that? Instance of. Instance of. So one thing you can't do is just make up your own keywords and expect that. <laughs> right? So now I've, I've overridden the put method. Now my put method behaves however I want it to behave. And all the other map methods are just one liners that delegate to the thing. Do you automatically get the uh, uh, implement some interface? So all, you, all the interfaces that map implement, do you respond if something queries? You do. So what you don't get, so you're going to save this. And I'm going to go look at the class again. Uh, and right now, my helper class does not implement map. Right? There's nothing map about it. If I do this, Run this again. We see now it does implement map. And it also implements, so if map extended some other, other interface, all those methods have to be accounted for here, or this class wouldn't compile. And so everything that it takes to be a valid map, the compiler is generating for us here. Does that address your question? Yeah. 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 And it, well, one thing that's not happening is that we're not implementing all the interfaces that this class implements. We're not delegating to a hash map, we're delegating to a map. And if it turns out that uh, hash map implements some other interfaces and we want to be a part of all of that, this stack type over here drives what the compiler is going to generate for you. Normally, you would have an interface type over here. All right. 
So that's just uh, an example. I don't want to get too hung up on that particular example. That's just one example of uh, ASC transformation that's provided by uh, uh, that's provided by the framework. There's some others. I'm not going to pull the keynote up again. I'm a little afraid of uh, uh, crash twice here in the last few minutes. Um, but the, the last slide there lists a couple more of these. So there is an annotation called immutable. So you can mark a class as immutable, and uh, the compiler won't generate setters for um, for a property. So it only generate uh, a getters. There is a singleton annotation. So if you annotate a class with that singleton, then uh, what the compiler will do with that is generate a private constructor, so no one else can create an instance of that class. Uh, the compiler will add a, a property like this. It will be something like, say, my helper instance, like that, and be initialized uh, without getting uh, bogged down in the details of what's going on there. The idea is that there are ASD transformations provided by the, um, by the Ruby core that allow you to express things like this, right? That I want to delegate to a map, and then a bunch of, a bunch of useful stuff gets generated at compile time. Uh, what I want to uh, look at this afternoon is what do those ASD transformations look like? And uh, what would it take if, if the delegate annotation didn't exist, but we wanted that kind of behavior? What, what does that look like trying to build that? So what I'm going to do is create uh, the most simple ASD transformation we can make. Just going to do one simple thing. And just doing that one simple thing uh, should give you a, a, at least some sense for how a lot of this works and, and some of the capabilities. Uh, so let's just jump into that and see what some of that looks like. Uh, so let's write a test here. I'll call it magic number spec. Again, our test is going to extend uh, spark.lang that specification. And we create a class called widget. Doesn't that have anything interesting in it? I want to create an instance of that class and then assert that widget, that magic number, is equal to 42. Right? So that should fail, right? Because there is no property called magic number uh, declared in the, um, the widget class. And it did fail. We got a missing property exception, no such property, magic number is the class widget. Alright. So we, we want this to pass. We want the widget to somehow have a property called magic number. Uh, so we saw in the previous session some techniques we might uh, accomplish this goal with. We might do something like widget.metaclass, that get magic number, is this, right? That should work. If I don't have any checklist there, we're going to get from widget.metaclass, that get magic number, is that, no such property widget. Is a typo there someplace? It's not in that Not yet. It's just yeah, but it's just, uh, it's, we're using property access, but uh, the point there's a, a type of someplace. But I can runtime add a method to that class. That's not what I want to do, right? One of the, the drawbacks of doing uh, runtime metaprogramming is that runtime metaprogramming is only accessible from Groovy, right? So it's Groovy's dynamic dispatch mechanism that goes to look at the meta class and, and uh, allows uh, all that runtime metaprogramming stuff to work. That's one of the limitations of runtime, Ruby's runtime metaprogramming system, is you can only take advantage of it from Ruby. It can be applied to Java classes. Right? We saw that in string that meta class that something. Um, but if I had Java code that was trying to make calls into Ruby code, those calls don't participate in Ruby's dynamic dispatch mechanism. Right? Java has its own dispatch mechanism that doesn't take advantage of meta class stuff. So one of the limitations of runtime metaprogramming is that it's, it's only accessible from Ruby code. One of the benefits of compile time metaprogramming is you're, effect, you're, you're participating in the compilation process, right? You're affecting the dot class files that are going to be generated on the file system. And if you write an AST transformation that adds a method to uh, adds, adds a method to a class at compile time, that method's in the class, right? So now you can call that method from Java or Ruby or Scala or Fluir or JRuby or whatever. It's, it's, a, it's a method in the class. It does not rely on Ruby's runtime uh, dispatch mechanism. So that's one of the benefits of compile time metaprogramming is, is that code's in the back. All right, so let's, uh, let's see if we can make this work. I'm going to start by creating an annotation that we'll call magic number. We want this uh, annotation to be a source level annotation. And we 
want it to be applied to classes, to types. Alright, so now I've got an annotation called magic number. And what I want to happen is any class that's annotated with magic number should have a magic number property associated with it. And of course, it's not going to work yet. We haven't done enough to make it work. Uh, all we've done is to find an annotation that doesn't, doesn't make anything interesting happen. But without making any more changes to this code, we're, we want to make, uh, make this test pass. Right, so every class that's annotated with magic number should have a magic number property. And we're just going to have it always return to number 42. So one of the things we're going to need to do is we're going to need to write an AST transformation. And we can write this in Java or in Ruby. We're going to write it in Ruby. Uh, let's see, magic number transformation. And I want this class to implement AST transformation. And AST transformation defines uh, just one method. And that method is, uh, is called visit, and the visit method accepts uh, two parameters. We do this, we go to your compile. Alright, so I want this class to be executed um, anytime a class is compiled that is marked with the magic number um, annotation. There we go. All right. Uh, and I'm going to forego some error handling here and uh, do a little bit of hand waving and just focus on the parts that, uh, uh, that, that I want to focus on. Uh, one thing that uh, will become, become clearer as I write some of this code is writing ASD transformations is not uh, it's not simple the little world of kind of stuff. It's not the stuff you want the, the new programmer who's only been working for a couple of weeks to do. Uh, they, this could get fairly complicated. It's also super powerful stuff. <coughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Class equals so one. It turns out that the second element in this array is going to be the class that was marked with our annotation. Part one is going to be some tangling around. So I'm going to mark our annotation with a, uh, an annotation called AST transformation class. Ruby AST transformation class. And pass a string here that is .magic number transformation. And what this tells the Groovy compiler is that anytime a class is annotated with this annotation, this has to be this is Java. Entirely possible. Uh, in the string. In the string. Ah, yeah. Transformation. Uh, so what that uh, what that tells the compiler is that anytime a class is annotated with this annotation, anytime a class is annotated with magic number, uh, apply this transformation to that class. Apply the combo demo dot magic number transformation to that class. And this code, this method will be invoked which is giving you the opportunity to transform the AST that's associated with that class that was marked with the magic number annotation. So let's say code equals new return statements, new constant expression 42. Alright, uh, what that's about is we're creating an instance of a class called a return statement. And I, and there are a number of things I could pass as an argument to the return statement. In this case, I'm passing the literal 42. So a constant expression is one kind of expression. There are lots of different kinds of expressions. Uh, keep this as simple as I can. So what this is, is it's the AST um, equivalent of writing code in source code like that, right? Return 42. So I'm creating uh, a node that represents a return statement and expressing what I want the return statement to return. Right? I'll do this. Now I'm going to create a method node to put that code in. And uh, let's see, I want this to be get magic number. The second argument is the return to the modifier, so the return type. So 
So we want this to be a public method. I want to return an integer. I want it to accept no parameters. Uh, I don't want it to deal with any exceptions, and I want that code to be the body of the method. All right. So now what we've got is uh, we've created some code on line 15. Our code is simply a return statement. And we can create nodes to do method calls and for loops, anything that can be expressed in source code. There are corresponding uh, classes like return statement and try catch it. Anything you can express in source code, there are corresponding classes in uh, the Groovy AST packages to represent those things. So I'm creating a very simple piece of code that just uh, returns the literal 42. I'm creating a method that contains that code. Right? And that code, again, could be as complex or have as much or as little in it as I like. I'm creating a new method node. The name of the method is uh, get magic number. Uh, I need to import uh, job.link that reflects that modifier. The name of the method is uh, get magic number. Uh, the method is public. Uh, the method accepts uh, or has a return type that is uh, job.link.integer. You can import class helper there. <laughs> okay. Uh, method name is get magic number is a public method. It returns an integer. It accepts no parameters. This argument allows you to express uh, things about uh, uh, the exceptions that the uh, method might throw. And the last argument of the method of constructor is the code that's inside the method. Now we can say the class dot add method method. Just like that. That's right. Right, so this ASD transformation is going to be applied to every class that's marked with the um, uh, magic number annotation. Alright, this class is done, I think. Alright, uh, there's really only four lines of code here, right? There's not a whole lot going on here. But, uh, are there any questions about any of this code? On. So uh, there's lots of stuff we can do in here. All we're doing is creating a, a method that contains one expression that's a return statement, return 42. This class is marked with the Groovy AST transformation annotation. That tells Groovy that this is an AST transformation. Uh, we also need to implement the AST transformation interface. The AST and the transformation interface defines this one method. That method will be called on every class that this transformation is being applied to. And it turns out that the only classes that this transformation is going to be applied to is classes that are marked with the at magic number annotation. Uh, so this is what's called a, a local transformation. And it's only being applied to classes that are annotated with, uh, with magic number. Uh, there's another kind of uh, transformation called a global transformation, which is applied to every class that's being compiled by, by Groovy. Uh, so a couple things about that is your ASC transformations are only applied to Groovy classes. Right? You can't uh, compile Java classes and expect the ASC transformation to be applied. They're only applied to Groovy classes. Global ASC transformations are applied to all Groovy classes, and local ASC transformations are only applied to classes that sort of pop into that. And in our case, our local ASC transformation is only going to be applied to classes that are marked with the magic number interface. And depending on what problem you're trying to solve, it may be the case that you need to use a global transformation. But when you can use a local transformation, that's better, right? Because global transformations are being applied to every single class. So when you write a global transformation, often what you end up with is code inside of here that says, if some condition is true, then do the uh, apply the transformation. Otherwise, don't. Right? It turns out that there aren't that many things that you want to do to every single class. But you might have to write a global AST transformation because you can't, uh, for whatever reason, for any of a number of reasons, you can't impose something on the system like, in order for this transformation to be applied, you have to use a certain annotation, right? So, uh, local, local transformations are only applied to classes that opt into them, and global transformations are applied to everything that's being applied. We have, we have a question first, yeah. Yeah. But go ahead in the back there. Uh, in the annotation, you're referring to the um, AST transformation class as a string. Uh, 
That's right. Is there a way to use the class directly? I don't think that you can use the class directly. So you're talking about this right here? Yes. Yeah, I think that has to be a string. I don't think that another attribute. No, no, it, it, uh, it, it gives classes. Yes. Yeah, yeah class, there's a classes attribute. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. It works. So there, there is some, sorry. No, go ahead. There is something, a new project, I don't know if you heard about it, the, the Groovy Macro. Did you heard about this project? Did you say Groovy Macro? Yes. Uh, I don't know about Groovy Macro. Yeah, so this is, an, um, this is a project that I think now it's a pull request to the Groovy core, which allows you to write transformations as a Groovy code. And it transfers it to be this not very readable and very nice code um, inside it. So you actually can write this statement of the, the content of this method, which is very simple, in this case just 42, but can be very complicated, not in terms of statements and expressions and all this like ugly code, but as a code, and it will translate it to all those expressions um, in the inside. Yeah, so I don't know about Groovy Macro in particular, but there's a thing called the AST Builder. So it's even more powerful than the Builder. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I don't know about the macro uh, subproject, but uh, I think I need to look into that. But there is a will make to the Groovy core and then it will get to popularity to actually deserve So there's a thing called the AST, the AST Builder, which is part of Groovy core that allows you to do stuff like this, right? You create an instance of the Builder and call it Build from Code and pass a closure and just put some code in there. And that the ASD builder is responsible for turning that into. Uh, but this is string. ASD, yes. This is string. The code that you put inside. Oh, uh, it doesn't have to be a string. Yeah, but it, the what what you can write there it's kind of limited. The the, code, the amount of code that you can write. Now. Because this is a closure, so you can right. put, you can put, only put there what can be put inside closure. You cannot put a method there. Uh, that's true. Yeah. So that's, that's right. the big difference. Yep. Yeah, I'll uh, keep an eye out. I'll look into that, but I don't know what this is. Yeah, no problem. Nobody yeah. knows, so that's good. That's Are you good working thing. on that? Are you working on that yourself? Uh, no, but I know the I know the contributor guy that actually wrote it, and I try my best to push it forward because it really improves your experience on writing ASD transformations. Yeah. So writing ASD transformations is tedious. It's easy to get stuff wrong. So, so we've written a really, really simple ASD transformation here. Uh, so there's not too much I've, I've gotten wrong. Uh, and, it, and it did work, by the way. So if I run this test, I just commented out the magic number annotation, the test fails. If I run it now, the test will pass. So the widget class really has been compiled to include a get magic number, uh, get magic number method. Writing ASD transformations can get uh, tedious and complicated. It's easy to write uh, ASD transformation code that's uh, really difficult to look at and comprehend. Uh, so you really have to be careful when you're doing that. But the, the API provides all kinds of really sophisticated uh, capabilities. You know, when, when in Grails, when you write a controller like this, so if you, if you write a controller that has uh, an action like save person P, Right? And then you, you, your code is uh, the code does whatever the, the save action needs to do. There is an ASC transformation in Rails that recognizes that uh, this controller action accepts uh, a domain class as an argument, and we generate a whole bunch of cool stuff right at compile time. So we generate a no argument method that does something like person p equals person dot get params dot id uh, p dot validate save. Right, I'm grossly oversimplifying what's going on, but stuff like that is being generated at compile time. Right? You, you express just this, and uh, at compile time, we generate a whole bunch of other stuff. Right? Code that goes to query to retrieve the person object from the database if there is a params.id, and if not, uh, depending on the request method, different, different things can happen. Lots of capabilities are being added to classes at compile time. Yeah, and that, that was one of my questions about the global is those global transformations then in Grails, basically? Yes. Sort of. Uh, so in Grails, we've got a mechanism that, uh, that knows about all of your artifacts, right? We know about the main classes. So we've got kind of our own uh, hand-rolled mechanism that says, okay, here's all the domain classes, apply these transformations to them. Here's all the service classes, apply these transformations to them. Uh, but that's all Grails, a lot of that is Grails-specific stuff. Other comments or questions about that? Right, 
in recent versions of Grails, you've been able, well, you've always been able to annotate service classes with app transaction, uh, and controller classes as well, with app transaction. And normally, what are, historically, what that's meant is uh, that was Spring's transactional annotation. And uh, what Spring does with that is, of course, Spring doesn't do any crazy stuff at compile time because you can't with Java. Uh, Spring uses uh, proxies, right? So when you put an instance of a class in the Spring application context and that class is annotated with as transactional, a Spring proxy is created and that proxy does all the transactional stuff, right? Uh, which is great, that's powerful, and, and uh, it's great that that capability exists. But it has some drawbacks, right? Uh, in recent versions of Rails, we have our own version of uh, our own transactional annotation, and uh, that triggers a local AST transformation, right? So you've written a service, and you've annotated it with that transactional. That triggers a, a local AST transformation, just like the one that we've written here. And what that transformation does is it generates all the code at compile time that does the transaction handling stuff. So it's all happening. All the transaction management stuff is really in the bytecode. Um, so you're not relying on uh, proxies, and you're not necessarily, uh, I think you're still tied to Spring, but not tied to Spring in the same way you are with, uh, with the proxy approach. Okay, that's just one more example of, of uh, uh, how uh, compile time transformations uh, have a lot of intricate capabilities to the rest of Other comments or questions about any of that stuff? Yeah. yeah. So um, when you've developed, you, um, you have this uh, AC transformation in a separate sub-project. I think it is not possible to have the code for the AC transformation, the class that uses the transformation in the same project, or is there a way to, to have this in one place? Yeah, so uh, I do in fact have two different projects here. I've got an app project and a transform project. Uh, they're really sub-projects of, uh, so if I got out of the IDE and just went out here to the command line, uh, I can a test. It's really one project with two sub-projects in it. Um, but when you're, if, if you're trying to apply, I've got code in that project that will compile that, that has nothing to do with the AST transformations. But if you're trying to apply AST transformations in the same compile time as stuff that, uh, while you're compiling the transformation. So you're compiling the transformation and trying to apply it all in the same process, that's, you get chicken and egg problems and bad things can happen there. There is, a, there is a nice trick to test this kind of stuff in the same project. Yeah. You need to assert script inside your unit test, and then you're good because you get those two phases. Yeah, there, so there are ways to, to get, get around the issue. Uh, in GTTS in particular, if I put these in the same project, GTTS is going to uh, blow up and say, hey, you can't do that. Uh, so I've got these in separate sub-projects just to keep things, uh, to keep all the build complexity stuff simple and keep that out of the the demo that I wanted to do. Uh, but yeah, typically you would write an ASC transformation as part of a, part of a, a library or tool or something that will be taken advantage of by other applications potentially. Like Rails, right? Rails provides a bunch of ASC transformations and those transformations are applied in a different context. Right? They're applied when you're building your Rails app, not when you build Rails. Okay. Other comments or questions? Uh, so that's all the specific stuff that I want to look at. If there are uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to talk about uh, whatever questions you might have. Otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll call it a day. Last call, you have any question? Well, I missed the first talk. I don't know if you talked about traits in the first talk. I didn't talk about traits, but that's, uh, uh, that would be more suitable for compile time stuff. So we've got a couple of minutes so I can talk about traits. Um, do you have a specific question about traits or just want to hear a few words about traits? Uh, well, probably a few words about traits, but, but that apparently there's problems with traits and uh, AST transformations. I think it says that. Uh, so specifically what problem I'm talking about. So I'm actually uh, right now in the process. So, so, so work has begun on Rails 3. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that's changing in, in Rails 3. And one of the things that's changing in Rails 3 is uh, we're uh, using traits in a lot of places where we used to use AST transformations. Uh, so it's not the case that traits and AST transformations just don't play well together because they've been made, made, made to, to play well together. So one of the things that, uh, that, I've, that I've been working on the last couple of weeks is taking a lot of our AST transformations and rewriting those traits, and then at compile time, instead of doing uh, a bunch of this stuff, well, here, let's just let's do this. Let's say, uh, 
That's number three. And we're going to have a method here called getMagic number. We have this return a different value, so we can be clear about which one we're which one we're getting. Uh, so we're going to say the method number trait has a magic number, uh, get magic number method, and returns 2112. Let's go back over here to this thing. Get rid of that. Now our test is going to fail, right, because there is no such property. If I set this thing implements magic number traits, uh, it failed because magic number is now 2112. All right, there we go. So now the test passed. So I, I wrote a trait. And uh, what a trait looks like is it looks like a class, except you use the keyword trait instead of the keyword class. Uh, you can put methods in here. If anything you can do in a class, you can do inside of this uh, inside the trait. And now when you write a class that wants to take advantage of that, you implement the trait um, as if it were an interface. And what happens is uh, the widget class will be made to implement an interface called magic number trait. And all of the methods that are in magic number trait are now in this class, right? So we've got in browse through, we'll end up with traits like um, just kind of making this up, but there'll be methods like def save. Then there'll be a bunch of code inside the same method that's used to uh, persist objects to the data store. And you won't have to write classes that implement the data <coughs> tree, but there'll be an ASD transformation inside of Grails that makes your class implement the main class tree. So then at runtime, if you interrogate an instance of your domain class and say, does this thing implement domain class trait? It will. And all of these methods that are in the domain class trait uh, will be in your domain classes. So why isn't that in Groovy instead of traits? It is in Groovy. It is now. Traits? Yeah. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So this doesn't have anything to do with Grails. So I was using Grails just as an example, as a description. But what we're running here doesn't have anything to do with Grails. Well, that's something. Yeah. Yep, so traits are a language feature uh, provided, supported by the uh, by Ruby. Uh, so Grails is taking advantage of traits, but traits are. And so the mechanism that I described earlier about uh, a little, little, little bit of handling over where I said Grails has its own mechanism that says, okay, here's all your domain classes, put all these methods in the domain classes. We, we've really got kind of our own trait mechanism inside of Grails, and now that Ruby supports traits, uh, we'll need that. Uh, so we're going to be able to, to get rid of a bunch of code inside the browser and just take advantage of stuff offered directly by Ruby. Yeah? So what's the best way to, uh, to test and debug an ASD? <laughs> yeah, so what's the best way to test and debug an ASD transformation? And it gets uh, it's screwy, right? So if you wanted to debug the inside the get magic number method, uh, you can't, right? Where, where would your debugger stop? There's no line of code. There's so you can get, uh, that, that's a challenge, right? You're generating a bunch of code at compile time, and there's no good way for the person testing code that your transformation was applied to, they can't debug into it. Uh, that's just, that's one of the costs of doing uh, ASC transformations. As you're writing the ASC transformations, you can, uh, there, there are things you can do. Uh, it's, getting, it's too complicated to get into now. We've got a lot of this in Grails where we rig up our own class loader at test time. And inside that class loader, say, OK, apply these ASC transformations, and then compile a class based on where the class is just a string in your source code. So the string is loaded in the class loader. All these ASC transformations are applied in that class loading process. And then we can interrogate what was generated and make sure that it is what we expect it to be. Um, but if debugging is, is, there, is, is an issue, right? You can't debug into the get, get magic number. With traits, you can. Right? We can put a breakpoint here and debug into that, but that's different than what we're talking about up here. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember if you had a specific trait question or you just want to well, clarify. I, I'm, just, I'm just reading this thing here in the, in the, in the documentation on traits, and it, it ends with the sentence there is absolutely no guarantee that an AST transformation will run on a trait as it does on a regular class. So use it at your own risk. <laughs> Right. And of course, I wanted I wanted to write a trait that had a, that that had an at delegate transformation on it. Uh, <laughs> so there's no guarantee that, that will work. Uh, yeah. So I don't know if delegate in particular will work. Uh, that's a good example. Of how, do, how do you know? I guess is my question. I don't is what I meant to say because I, I don't know if it will work. 
Okay. I mean, I mean how, how, how would you find out? I mean, what's... Is there, gonna, is there more? Is there going to be some more documentation coming out on this, or? Yeah, no, the trade document, the trade documentation in particular is, is actively being written. Uh, so Cedric has, has built uh, a lot of that stuff. He's work, been actively working on the docs over the last month or so, not just on the trades, but the docs in general. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so as I said, I don't know if Delegate in particular will work in trades, but there are issues with applying ASD transformations to trades, and that's what is referenced. So, so, so as those issues are documented, then it would be possible to know what they are and avoid them. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so that that well, I'm familiar with the line in the docs that you're talking about. Uh, you're probably looking at data that uh, Ruby line. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that line is, uh, is unsatisfactory, right? We need to expand on that. But okay. that's all working. That's all yeah. working. Right? Okay. Would, Go ahead. No. Oh, you said, oh, I don't know if you said that, but traits are brand new in C3, so. They are a new language feature. This is why Rails hasn't taken advantage of them in the past, is they didn't exist in the past. It's a new language feature. Documentation is still emerging. I think the behavior is mostly, uh, I don't know what big gaps in the behavior, uh, so, so certainly they'll evolve over time, but I don't know what specific big gaps that are still pending things being filled in traits. Uh, the documentation, the line you're referring to in the documentation is, as I said, that's, uh, that's unsatisfactory. That'll, that'll eventually be better than it is right now. I don't know how we're going to be able to express, I guess we really need to tease out the details of what works and what doesn't and come up with a way to describe that so you'll know. Yeah. Uh, for example, if you write your own ASC transformation, can it be applied to a trait? Or which of the built-in transformations can be applied to traits? So being able to understand more of that is certainly important. Uh, right now, there are no docs so we can understand what people said, I don't think, uh, about uh, a lot of those details. Yeah. This trade example, how is that different than a mix in? Uh, it is a mix in of sorts, right? You're mixing behavior into a class that compile time. So well, I, I guess it's a kind of mix in. So, so if you ran down the feed, you would see a get magic number? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so if we ran a Java P on whatever class uh, implemented on this widget class, there really is a method called get magic number. And uh, in the bytecode, you can call that method from Java, which you cannot do if, if the method were metaprogrammed or something like this, right? You say okay. you can't call this method from Java, but you can call a method that's added uh, by way of trait or by way of an ASD transformation. Which is the difference with mixins, right? Mixins are implemented on the meta class, aren't they? Uh, Ruby's runtime mixins are uh, oh, that's runtime meta class thing and stuff. More generally, this this is a kind of mix-in. Right. So, right. says the mix-in annotation is deprecated in favor of traits. Yeah. So that's okay. <laughs> and there are times when some of these options make more sense than others, right? So in order for you to apply a trait, you you have to be authoring this class. Right? So if you're authoring the class and you want that behavior, you can express a implements adding over trait. There are times when uh, that's not the case. If you, there are times when you need to apply behavior to code that uh, that you're not authoring. Grails, again, is a great example of that. You write a domain class, and somehow we need to, uh, without knowing about your domain class ahead of time, at compile time, we need to add stuff to your class, right? Um, so we can't, it, it would be, be a little bit lame if all of your domain classes had to implement uh, Grails domain class trait. That, 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 wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't be a very good thing. So we've got, mecha we've got mechanisms that tie these together, right? We've got an ASC transformation that's applied to your domain class at the compile time. And that ASC transformation is adding, basically adding this to your class. So we can take advantage of everything that traits have to offer without imposing any, you don't even have to know that traits are involved, right? You write a domain class that looks like this, and it turns out that uh, we're using ASC transformations and traits to add a bunch of interesting capabilities to your domain class, but none of that shows up in your, in your source code. It doesn't have to show up in your source code. Yeah, one more question. Yeah. Um, so the ASD transformation, there's uh, multiple like compiler phases that it participated. in. There are. And so there's a default one, right? That that just can you maybe comment on what the different phases are for? Yes. Uh, so or do you would even care normally? <laughs> yeah. So I think it's called compile phase. So there are a number of compile compilation phases, um, and they're all uh, enumerated in this uh, enum called uh, compile. So initialization is so there are brief descriptions in the job box here to tell you uh, what each of these phases represent. 
most of what you're going to do in, in ASD transformations, it turns out, uh, will be done in semantic analysis. Um, the details of uh, the, the differences between all of the, the compilation phases get, uh, get complicated. And even, and this is not an area of my own particular expertise, but even the folks uh, that this, this is their area of expertise, it's a little bit, it's a little bit funky the way some of the compilation phase stuff works. Um, so really all, all, that, uh, all that I'll say about that is there, there are a number of phases during, so, uh, the, so when the compiler is doing its thing, we're iterating through all these phases. Uh, an ASD transformation gets to express which of these phases it wants to participate in. In general, you want to do things as early as you can do them. But uh, there's, depending on what your ASD transformation is doing, you can't necessarily go all the way to the front line because you need other stuff to have happened before your ASD transformation. So for example, your AS, the ASD transformation that we wrote over here can't be applied before the system knows that the magic number annotation has been applied to some class, right? So this has to happen after uh, the group compiler has figured out that there's a class annotated with that magic number. Uh, so I, I expect that that's a completely unsatisfactory answer. And that's, that's what I have to offer. <laughs> All right, uh, so, so we're out of time. I'm happy to talk about this as long as anybody uh, has questions about it. If you have questions, please come see me and let me know. I'll be happy to help you with uh, anything that I can. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.